My journey as an artist and teacher started in high school with a really incredible high school uh, art teacher and I took sculpture classes, learning metal working and some uh, foundry work. But my studies in glass started at Alfred University in 1992. I took my first glass blowing class and studied glass alongside of sculpture for almost three and a half, four years. But I had, after my studies at Alfred University, I was not 100% committed to working in glass because I work and love other materials. And I studied at the Cranbrook Academy of Art from 1996 to 1998 and received a Master's of Fine Art degree uh, in sculpture and also studied industrial design and architecture. So I think that my studies in sculpture uh, across my undergraduate and my graduate degree strongly influenced the way that I approach work now. At the time in glass, there were a whole bunch of influences that at the time were interacting with contemporary art, functional art, studio glass, and I find that the kiln cast glass is kind of where I land the most. The bronze casting I did in the early 2000s was to a certain extent autobiographical and that led to an investigation because I grew up in and around the city of Detroit. Every time I would leave the city and return to the city, I was struck by the transformation of the city and so I had a really different lens on the city every time I would return. And then I began to think about what kind of work I could make that was a way of investigating the transformation of the city and the transformation of the landscape. And so the autobiographical work that was the bronze casting became the autobiographical work related to the city of Detroit, which then expanded into a much larger investigation. The questions that I created related to the city of Detroit became questions I could apply to other cities across America, mostly in the Midwest, because I was interested in cities that were like Detroit. And in some ways, you can learn a lot about other cities by studying Detroit because they have similar patterns. So if you want to look at the transformation of industry, the transformation of population, where we are today, there's a lot of patterns to understand through the city of Detroit that are quite similar to other cities like Cleveland, Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, St. Louis, other cities that have gone through similar growth and or the ebbs and flow of industry. So in the Detroit population shift and in the Recasting Michigan series, which was a project I was working on from about 2007 to about 2010, I was really interested in tools and materials related to industry. So a lot of those projects are focused on materials specifically used by the automobile industry. And it was a time when I was really teaching myself a lot of 3D modeling, 3D printing, and understanding a lot of the new modes of manufacturing within that industry, and that body of work embodies that. I was also beginning to experiment with data visualization, so understanding how data can take on three-dimensional forms. And in the Detroit population shift, its height is based on the time of the city, the length that the city has been in place, and then the width is based on population. The overall shape that's extruded across the form is based on the city boundary. So I used that project, the Detroit Population Shift Project, to then look at a larger project or develop a larger project based on studying 24 American cities. And that project is called Cities Departure and Deviation. That's 24 American cities made out of blown glass with Encamo bubbles, so they are two different colors. Those colors describe change and also the kind of dramatic shift in population. And the Detroit population shift 
piece has been a really significant project for me, not only because I learned a lot in the process of making it, which is, I think, true of all of the work in the exhibition here today, but I think about it in a way that it also was pivotal in the way that I approach thinking about the new recast series as well. So the data visualization is about shaping data. The new recast series is about shaping geography. And so in a lot of ways, the geography is shaped by the objects that the geography is placed on or grafted onto. And so the, the geography for Portland, Oregon is grafted or, or shaped based on the, the tree stump. The oil drum geography is pierced by the hole to get the liquid in and out of the oil drum. The Libby Hopstar cups are sort of punching through the landscape and leaving parts of the landscape absent. And so one of the things as an artist that I'm really interested in with the relationship between the objects and the landscape is how the landscape influences the geography and or vice versa. And within the work, one of the conceptual things that I've been thinking about for the better part of 10 years, and this is related to growing up in the city of Detroit and also living in a, you know, Plainwell, Michigan, which is a small paper mill town, is understanding that power dynamic between the industry and community and how that plays out over time. And the way that I see it playing out in the work is the way the geography is shaped by the object or the shape of the object is derived by the geometry. So how those two, two power dynamics happen within the work. And I have the ability to change those things because I'm working in the computer with exporting or manipulating the 3D modeling data, which is the city model. So I can change the size of that, and in some cases I can change the shape of that pretty easily to understand how it fits onto the object. But I think the work is also a reference to the culture of making things. You know, the industry, a lot of the industry that it references is manufacturing. We've kind of lost that sense of making in a lot of ways uh, across the cities that are represented here. You know, I worked at Kohler as an artist in residence in 2010 and 11 and 12, and one of the experiences I had was coming to the residency in 2010, the, you know, I made a project where my, actually my partner and I, my, my wife and I, Sarah Lindley, were residents in the factory together we made a project using LiDAR data that was actually a representation of the factory. The LiDAR data was good and, you know, it was an interesting 3D model, but one of the things that it showed, which was sort of unintentional, was that it was LiDAR data from about 2003, and we were working in the factory in 2010. The parking lot was nearly full in 2003. In 2010, the parking lot was never a third full. So it actually described how many people had been laid off in the factory or people had been encouraged to retire and not rehired. And it also spoke to the automation that had been brought into the factory to replace those people. So it was pretty dramatic for a lot of the workers that were still there in the factory. They, didn't, they were like, oh, the, the model is kind of interesting, kind of cool. But what it described to them, it actually brought some of them to tears. You know, the transformation of, of, you know, the kind of community of people that work in that place. So for the last eight or 10 years, I've been using a combination of LiDAR scan data. And so the LiDAR scan data can be downloaded from the USGS website, and then it goes through several steps of processing. So the raw data that you get is not usually very usable for projects like this. So there's three or four steps of processing the data to 
turn the point clouds into models and then you usually have to do a lot of cleanup to then provide something that's 3D print ready. In the case of recasting Muskegon, there wasn't a really high resolution LIDAR file of the city. And so I was able to do photogrammetry with Google Earth, which meant that, you know, with LIDAR data, because you can't, you know, you're doing airplane flyovers of the landscape, you don't actually capture very much data that isn't, you know, ground data or the tops of buildings. And so, you know, the sides of buildings kind of get lost in the mix. Sometimes landscapes, tree canopies, those kinds of things also don't translate really well. With photogrammetry, we export 1,600 images from Google Earth, and then we stitch everything together, and then we turn that into a 3D model, and you get much more detail in terms of how the built environment begins to interact with tree canopies and things like that, which I think tells the story of how cities work in relationship to how people use them, how people uh, interact with them, what the, where the green spaces are, where the industrial components are, and where those two things potentially meet. My process is to find the object that I'm going to graft the landscape onto and then think about the scale in which I need to work. So for example, the Portland piece, I had the LiDAR data that I was going to use, and then I had to find a Douglas fir tree or a chunk of a Douglas fir tree in Michigan, which is not impossible, but it's not something that you can just find anywhere. And so there's a sawmill, at least there was a sawmill north of Grand Rapids, that does a lot of custom work and they were able to find me a piece and we cut a piece and then I actually sent that log to a company that did a high resolution 3D scan of it and they sent me the scan and then I was able to, in the computer, change the scale, rotate the landscape, and graft the two together so that you could get the moments where the water rolled over the part where the, you know, becomes like a waterfall almost where the bark had been ripped off the tree. And so you have these intentional relationships between the landscape and the object. And some of them happen just by, you know, cutting a hole in the 3D print and fitting it to the object, sometimes it happens completely in a digital way. And then that the Portland project was output as a 3D print, the whole project, and then a mold was made of it, and then I cast it in wax. And when I work, you know, I'm doing a lot of digital work, and a lot of times you don't see that digital work, or you might see the digital work within the glass because it captures a certain amount of the 3D printing process. So you might see the stair-stepping or the layers of the 3D printing process somehow embedded in the final casting. But the glass is kiln cast, the glass is not 3D printed. So I make waxes, I do fairly traditional investment casting, and then, you know, some of my pieces can be in the kiln for three weeks, some of them are in the kiln for three months. It really depends on the complexity of the shape, and then typically, Casting temperatures, because I'm working with several different kinds of glass, casting temperatures range from 1,550 degrees to maybe 1,600 degrees. And molds can stay at that temperature for 24 hours to really kind of get the glass to settle into all of the fine details of the mold. And those molds that go in the kiln are single-use molds. So they're big, big blocks of plaster. They come out of the kiln, they get soaked with water, they disintegrate and the piece gets excavated. It can take up to two days to excavate a piece depending on how fragile it is. So a piece like Portland, probably three or four hours to excavate it. A piece like Recasting New York, which has you know buildings really, really close together, can easily take a day or a day and a half to remove the plaster so you safely you know, the plaster's strong and the glass is strong, but there's often something that wants to give in there if you're not careful enough.
In the recast series, I use, you know, the object to tell one story. The object has a fairly contemporary landscape on it, usually within two or three years. And then I also incorporate a vinyl photograph or aerial photograph from an earlier time period. So aerial photograph became kind of a standard tool for mapping the landscape in the 1950s. Pre-1950s, we had other data sets like Sanborn Maps or companies like the Sanborn Mapping Company that were primarily used for insurance mapping. And now the aerial photographs and Google Earth are the standard. And then we have hybrid technology through GIS that kind of incorporates all of that data as a series of layers. And so I often think about my work as a series of layers. So the object is one layer of data, which is a fairly contemporary snapshot of the landscape. And then you have an aerial photograph that's another snapshot of the landscape from a much earlier time period. And so it's also about how people use the land. And, you know, we could say that Recast Cities is about industry, which it is, but it's also about where people and how people use the land. And so one way to describe how people use the land is through the transformation of that land. And so the aerial photographs from the earlier time period, which typically range from the early 1950s through the mid to late 1960s, there's not always high resolution aerial photographs of every city from every year. So there's choices that have to be made or curatorial processes that have to be made based on what's available and what gives the best picture or snapshot, literally, of what was happening on that site before. And then, you know, you can kind of, as a, as a participant or a viewer within the work, you can kind of bounce back and forth between the object and the vinyl and begin to understand the transformation of that land. It's my hope that by visiting the exhibition that it is a conversation starter. If the conversation isn't already there, that people consider our relationship to the land, to the community in which we work, the power dynamic between industry and community. We're heavily reliant on the employers within our community, sometimes giving them more power than they need. But I also think that they give us stability. But several of the cities depicted in the project, you see what happens in terms of the vacuum when those industries transform or no longer are part of the community. And I think that that begins to create bigger questions about how you stabilize the community, what are the identities of the community beyond that industry, and how the community moves forward. And I wanted to just say that part of that question is tied to, you know, my own experience living in the city of Detroit from, you know, the early 70s through kind of the late 90s, and then also living in Plano, Michigan, and seeing the transformation of that small town based on a paper mill and then moving there just as the paper mill closed and realizing that the paper mill was a super fun site after the paper mill closed and then the cleanup happened and then the community took over the industrial site and began to reuse it as part of the community. I don't think that all of the stories are pessimistic or negative, but I think that there's a lot of considerations and questions associated with how these transformations happen within communities. And the project is ultimately about the people. So the people who work there, the people who live there, and you know, I know these are small depictions of the landscape, but they are places that people live and work. And ultimately, I want people to connect with those places through the objects.